never taught uh, this experience that I see described on the web as grave sucking. <laughs> yeah. And God can release this same impartation onto you and just before. Never taught it, <laughs> never done it. We just release the anointing of God um, that is in this place. We pray that I teach regularly in the school ministry and then the dean of school ministry. This is not something we teach or preach. So in the school ministry, we had one of our leaders had a profound encounter with the Lord uh, at the grave of a former church leader. So wow, 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 wow. We got some fun topics to discuss. We're going to talk about grave sucking today. Grave sucking today. <laughs> A.M. A term that I don't think we coined. Uh, one of our critics or a concerned citizen uh, coined it, but uh, it stuck. And it was quite amusing when we first heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hi, 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 yeah, yeah. Exactly. Starting in June of the year 2021, Bethel made a series of videos they called Rediscover Bethel. This one was about the specific topic of grave sucking or grave soaking. Out of all the videos in this series from Bethel, this one is by far the most popular one. It's the one that people have watched, in some cases, 10 times more than other ones. You can see that some of these videos only got five or 10,000 views, but this one got almost 200,000 views, and the one about the Kundalini spirit got just over 80,000 views. So those two videos together show that these are the topics that people are really interested about the most in this Rediscover Bethel playlist. Recently, I watched this grave soaking Bethel video again, and uh, I was doing it as part of the American Gospel Spirit and Fire docu series, which will be coming out soon. In fact, here, let me play you just a little bit of a preview of that upcoming docu series. And so we just rip it right out of the ground. We just suck it right off his dead bones in Jesus' name. I don't think you have to be a cessationist, for example, to be concerned about adopting new age and or pagan and occult practices. So as an apostolic team with the authority that God's given to us. They really believe they're apostles and they believe they have apostolic authorities. We decree and declare that racism well, and it's, it's blasphemous and sad. So I encourage you very much to watch all of the American Gospel productions and to stay tuned for that new one. But the reason I wanted to make my own video right now was reading all these positive comments on this Bethel video. It's really discouraging because what they did in this video was talk out of both sides of their mouths. They claimed that they didn't know anything about grave soaking, and yet the more you watch the video, the more it becomes clear that they are living in the results of their own activity. They had people on staff teaching and practicing these things. So that's why I want to make a quick video to go over this again, and also to talk about some of the things that have transpired since the video originally came out. As an example of some of the really strange teaching that's associated with Bethel and this whole grave soaking thing, I want to read a comment from one of the people that really liked this video. Look at their comment on the top there. Here, I'll zoom in. I appreciate Bethel's desire to try and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and sometimes it gets messy. The alternative of walking in the Spirit is walking in the flesh, and my fear is that there is a whole group of Christians who are afraid to step out of their comfort zone to be led by the Holy Spirit. A non-believer once said to me, if your God is so powerful, ask him to let me win the big bingo jackpot that night. My immediate reaction was, the Bible says, don't tempt the Lord. But as I was walking away, I felt the Spirit say, go back and pray that God would demonstrate his power to that man and he would win that jackpot. The next morning, to everyone's amazement, Donald had won that jackpot. And as a result, he gave his heart to the Lord and the fear of God fell all over the warehouse and many more people were saved. As we step out of our comfort zone, that is where the Holy Spirit oftentimes will be there to accomplish the miraculous. But winning the jackpot isn't everything it seems to be. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Most people dream about hitting the jackpot, but they should be cautious with their wishes. In my mind, that man's comment is a direct result of Bethel's particular version of Christian theology. Well, anyway, let's get to the video. Here's Dan Farrelly and Bill Johnson. And as always, I have to significantly alter the video and the audio in order to avoid getting a copyright strike from Bethel. A lot of what our journey has been on is like learning to risk to enjoy the presence of the Lord. Have you found that risk is a part yeah, of that? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You have to just, you know, we, we want to be right. You never want to be I in error. I love being right. <laughs> yeah, I, but I mean, in, it, we, know, we don't want to be in error. Yeah. You know, we don't want to be deceived. I mean, those are always concerns, but, 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 but we are, we are it's almost like I'm required, it's almost like I have to be willing to fail to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's a huge part of our culture. So we don't always get it right. So then we clean up the mess. So then we clean up the mess. Every today. So then we clean up the mess. Every 
So it's, yeah. it's like it, Chris does this well. You should say Chris is right. Because <laughs> I am right. He, he presents... Uh, Good reports are coming on Monday. Good reports are coming on Monday. Good reports are coming on Monday. The two sides of a company, Apple Computers, for mm -hmm. example, research and development yep. and manufacturing. Well, your values in those two worlds are completely different. Dan Farrelly and Bill Johnson preface their discussion of the so-called grave-sucking controversy by talking about their culture of taking risks and how it's super important for them to have the ability to make mistakes in the process of learning how to enjoy the presence of God. They don't get this idea from the Bible. They get it from copying the corporate world where manufacturing gets everything right and research and development tries a bunch of things, many of which will fail in order to find that special new thing that no one's ever done before. This is not in the Bible, but that isn't supposed to bother you because they claim that when they make a mess, they'll clean it up. In just a moment, they're going to say unequivocally that they do not teach grave sucking. They don't know where this idea came from, and it kind of bothers them that they've been accused of such a thing. At the very same time, they're talking about why they have this culture of taking risks as a preface to why these things may have happened. You know, the things that they claim haven't happened. Manufacturing, you want zero defects. That's the power of zero defects. Yeah. Every product works perfectly. It looks just like the other. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. we don't want to recall. We yeah. don't have to, you yeah. know. But on research and development, if zero defect is your primary value, you won't invent anything. You won't mm -hmm. create anything. <laughs> but when it comes to ministry, when it comes especially to areas that are in the Bible that we don't know anyone who's, who's really living in fully. Mm -hmm. We experiment. <laughs> And that makes a lot of people nervous, but that yeah. is that is the nature of it. And sometimes we succeed, and when we do, it's usually big. <laughs> and when we fail, it's usually big. <laughs> it's usually big. <laughs> Yeah, and so th there's a there's a mess to clean up. But that's we have almost like uh, the unspoken agreement in our in our family in our leadership team is uh, research and development. Research and development. The research and development means we're going to invent innovative products and services. Yeah. We're going to create room to to see if we can learn together, stay accountable. Uh, but let's see if we can learn this thing together and, and touch into some things that are in the Word that are not the normal part of church life. Yeah. Say, so, hey, listen, I've been here since 1991, been under your leadership since 94 or so, 95, yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we never taught uh, this experience that I see described on the web as grave sucking, <laughs> never taught it, never done it. I teach regularly in the school of ministry and then the dean of school of ministry. This is not something we teach or preach. No, and so no, no, it's no. never taught uh, this experience that I see described on the web as grave sucking. <laughs> never taught it, never done it. I teach regularly in the school of ministry and then the dean of school of ministry. This is not something we teach or preach. No, and so no, it's, no, no. it's a, it is a bit alarming to sit in Reading and see the world think you think something and you know you don't. <laughs> So Dan and Bill don't understand why the world looks at Redding and thinks that they believe grave sucking is an appropriate thing to do. Here is Ben Fitzgerald. He moved to Redding in 2009 to attend the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, and then he served on staff as a pastor at Bethel Church for several years, real close to the time that he made this video. So here we are at Smith Wigglesworth's grave um, in Bradford. It's up the, the other end of England. You might not be able to come here naturally, but you can certainly feel it supernaturally what's happened in this man's life. And it's funny, all of us students, when we came here, the thing that we felt was uh, that like the raising of the dead power and the gift of faith came on us. And some students were leaning over the back of the grave and they felt a grace and a faith just rest on them. It's funny, isn't it? How, you know, Elisha, um, I think someone put the, the, bo the person's bones on his bones and they got raised up to life. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, he still exists there. Yeah. And God can release this same impartation onto you. And, and I believe right now the impartation is going to be the gift of faith is going to come on you. We release, we release, other students who want to come in, we just release over the, over the camera right now. We just release the anointing of God um, that is in this place. And we pray that faith, 
faith, <laughs> great faith would come on you. And we just release right now the anointing. Just take it now in Jesus' yeah. name. Yeah. Take enduring faith. And yeah. Take a great faith to do miracles, yeah. to work miracles in the neighborhoods, in the supermarkets, but yeah. also in supernatural impartation. And we want to impart it over you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're right here with us. There's no distance in the spirit. The same way Jesus yeah. spoke a word and said, your wow. son is healed right now, this very moment. We impart over you in Jesus' name that the history of the Welsh revival and the anointing for awakening That's right it. here can come upon your life now in Jesus' name. Jesus. So we release it on you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. <laughs> so we release that grace over you to see an awakening take place. I, I'll tell, I don't know if that's happened to any of our listeners, but it is odd. It like, is, how could you believe that about us without checking in with us or knowing? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, and, and then you've taught us early on. I think we're changing. We've had to change this. But you, you generally wouldn't respond to critics yeah. and come into a stance of opposition. And we all tried to model that early on. I, I think we still are trying to do that. But, <laughs> but we would just feel like, oh, no, no, we're not going to be drawn into defensive battles. To, in a video made expressly for the purpose of defending themselves, they claim that they do not want to get involved in defensive battles. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I, my approach, you know, is is pretty much the same. Yeah. I mean, well, we got it for it, you, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I I just figure if God doesn't defend me, I'm not worth defending. Yeah. You know, let him let him run my defense. Let him run my defense. I've listened to this section over and over again, trying to figure out exactly what does Bill Johnson mean when he says this. What would it look like for God to literally run defense for an individual? And if it's true that that has been Bill Johnson's method of operation, why did he change that method and make these series of videos where he tries to explain himself further? If God was already in the process of defending everything that he did. Did God stop running defense for Bill Johnson? Is that why he needed to make these videos? What it seems like is actually going on here is that Bill Johnson wants to sound as humble as possible, to sound like he's never going to try and defend himself. He'll let God do that. While at the same time, he's making these videos where he's, in my mind, trying to retain as many of his followers as he possibly can. But uh, there, there was a time several years back um, where there were some attacks in a newspaper, and I gave a one Sunday response. Yeah. And it was because of how, how young believers can be affected. Yeah, that, that was a concern. True. So I... I think it's appropriate to give a defense, yep. uh, but not to attack or retaliate or any of that kind of well, stuff. Well, and to give understanding, because lots of folks aren't attacking, they're just wondering at some point. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like uh, helpful to be able to say to them, exactly. like, hey, listen, this is not a practice exactly. that we do. Yeah. But it, it does, uh, it does, I don't know, gently, it's not holy, but it irks me. Like, how would you think this and perpetuate this myth? But it irks me. Like, how would you think this and perpetuate this myth? When it's something I'm in the environment, regularly teaching and living with these people, and this is not a practice that we are participating in and yeah. that we, we teach, or and certainly not with the, in the, the connections that people have made. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, every once in a while, I'd just be like, I'm not going to talk about that thing because it's so dumb. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's almost like the question, have you stopped beating your wife? Like, if I actually say yes or no, I, by implication, I'm guilty just from your question. So I'm not going to address your question, but over time, that, that yeah. probably used to work before the internet. and. And now every once in a while somebody Good discovers point. an old video or an old something rather like, hey, do you guys? Like, no, yeah, no, yeah. we don't. So hopefully yeah, this, exactly. this time of uh, talking will help put that to rest a little bit. It, it, may, it may in part come out of the fact that I have really felt strong from the Lord that we are to honor those who have gone before us. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge part of our culture. You know, the, we're, we're uh, going to be building this revival uh, uh, museum, library, library mm -hmm. House of Generals, where we give honor to people who have gone before us. And some of them ended poorly, and, uh, but we're, we're, we're going to try to honor them anyway. I mean, the way the scripture honors Solomon, he ended pretty, pretty poorly. Hezekiah, same. Yeah. So that's the mandate. And so I, I've gone to graves. I've prayed, but I don't, we don't talk to the dead. We don't yeah. try to get something from the dead. I mean, that's... So now Bill is starting to clarify a bit more. He admits that, yes, he does go to graves and he prays for things at those graves, but he doesn't talk to the dead, which I don't know if anybody accused him of doing. And he says we don't try to get something from the dead, which I believe him, but they're trying to get something from a gravesite where a dead person is buried. So there's not a, a whole lot of difference between getting something from the dead and getting something from the gravesite of a dead person. Yeah. But I will. I'll, I'll kneel. I'll humble myself before the Lord. I pray that Charles Finney, God, we, we need that kind of an awakening in our nation again. And, and I will go there. And, and I'm sure that... Uh, I, I suppose some of uh, the rumor comes out of that, that, the, that we will humble ourselves. Mm -hmm. and I've noticed how often Bill Johnson refers to himself as 
humbling himself while he's doing these things. He almost always combines, we humble ourselves and then we do such and such, because I think it makes it sound like it's not quite as bad as it otherwise would sound. And I've been, I, I remember in Wales, I went to the, the very, not only Evan Roberts' grave, but I went to the church where the power of God hit him so powerfully. Mm-hmm. And I just, I literally sat where he sat for, I think, maybe two hours. I just sat and just prayed. Yeah. I'm not talking to the dead. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not interested in conversation with angels. I, yeah. You know, when you have the Holy Spirit, why would you want to talk to anyone else? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm just asking God, do it again. Just do it again. So it's a, it's a huge topic and it would go all over, but you've just mentioned, so there are places of significance that are like a touchstone for our faith. So these places, like we've joked, the upper room, like in Israel, I don't know if you know this. Uh, <laughs> it's not the real upper room, by the way. That thing's <laughs> way under the dirt at some point, but, but you've been there. I yeah, haven't. Yeah. And you would say it's a touchstone it is. And that, that you've experienced the Lord's presence in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've had mighty things happen yeah. in that environment. And it may just be because people have been going there for so many years praying. Yeah. That, you know, there's just this thing that happens there. It doesn't matter to me how or what it is. It's just they they stir up all kinds of memories, emotions, scripture. You you see what happened in the original upper room and how significant that was. That uh, It's just a place to really, well, it's a contact point for faith. Yeah. So Bill Johnson is, again, being more clear there are places where you will contact something there that will increase your faith. There's some kind of a supernatural power in a physical location. Here's Ben Fitzgerald again teaching that exact thing. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, it still exists there. Yeah, the way you put it, I think, I think it's beautiful. Well, and to be super clear, sometimes a quote of yours is attributed to this idea that we're actually going to graves <laughs> looking for anointings to be, you know, to, to get and to pass on. So Dan admits that in order to be clear, they have to read a quote from Bill Johnson from the book Physics of Heaven, because that's where a lot of people get the idea that he promotes these things. You know, the idea that they're actually going to graves looking for anointings to get and to pass on. Well, let's listen to the quote. Um, There are anointings, mantles, revelations, and mysteries that have lain unclaimed literally where they were left because the generation that walked in them never passed them on. Okay, let's slow down and and read that first sentence. There are anointings, mantles, revelations, and mysteries that have lain unclaimed literally where they were left because the generation that walked in them never passed them on. So Bill is saying as clearly as he possibly can that these anointings or mantles or revelations or mysteries, whatever they are, they're in a certain spot and you got to go get them. You see, the people who had those things, they died and they made the mistake of not passing them on. So they're just sitting there at this physical location, namely the guy's grave, where you can go get them. Bethel pastor Ben Fitzgerald was just doing the very thing that Bill Johnson, senior pastor, was teaching him. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, he still exists there. I believe it's possible for us to recover (laughs) realms of anointing, uh, realms of insight, realms of God that have been Uh, untended for decades simply by choosing to reclaim them and perpetuate them for future generations. So at that point, you're talking about in honor and faith. What I felt the Lord speak to my heart like 20 years ago when I first started collecting for our our library museum Mm -hmm. was that if we honored the saints of the past, not worship, not talk to for sure, um, but if we honored them, the Lord would give us access to the grace that they lived in. Some students were leaning over the back of the grave and they felt a grace and a faith just rest on them. Access to the grace that they lived in. Um, so we release that grace over you to see an awakening take place. You know, there's so many things that previous generations accomplished that are, you know, the anointing on a Spurgeon, his yeah. his ability, yeah. uh, Wesley, to preach to Whitfield, mm-hmm. th- their anointings we need again. Absolutely, and uh, and 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 so I, I feel like we have a role to value and respect the person who said yes to God, the Spirit of God that marked them to bring such change. And so that's what I try to do is I try to honor that element, the Spirit of God, the person who said yes. And it's not it's not worship. It's just it's the right thing to do. And so that's what we do. You know, the Scripture is full of that. Scripture is full of honoring the the encounters these past saints have had with the Lord, yes. which are supposed to inspire us <laughs> yeah. to have like encounters and like impact in the earth. And so I, I think one thing around that same time was I, I had been through seven years of higher learning with, um, you know, in, in Christian community and had not heard hardly anything about the healing revivalists. So mm-hmm. I was a bit like, where, where were these stories yeah. in all the church history that was covered? Yeah. Where were these um, these stories of, of, of uh, revival that had signs and wonders and manifestations anointing them? Like, these folks were lost from history. Uh, Mariah Woodworth Edder, yeah. I hadn't heard anything about. John G. Lake, I hadn't heard anything about. So I'm, I'm in seven years 
mm-hmm. of evangelical, whom I love. I'm an evangelical. Kiss. <laughs> the, uh, you know, <laughs> the, uh, but, but to have like, wow, we've been kind of embarrassed or, or just didn't care or choose to remember. So before Dan Farrelly came to Bethel and became a charismatic, he was not familiar with John G. Lake, and he's trying to come up with reasons why that was the case. Well, the thing that he's ignoring is that John G. Lake was a fraud, he was a heretic, he was a con artist. If you're interested in getting more information, I do have a compilation article on the Messed Up Church website called The Pentecostal Cornucopia of False Teachers, Con Artists, Criminals, and Heretics, Part 1. Also, I'm working on a book along with Daniel Long on this very topic. It's a really important topic because in the charismatic world, there are just gigantic assumptions being made about all of these supposed great men of God, when in fact, there's a tremendous amount of historical information that says otherwise. The radical sacrifice yeah. and impact and power these folks moved in. And for me, that was eye-opening. So when I heard you say that statement, yeah. I'm like, hey, hey there's, a, there's a forgotten move of, of the Holy Spirit and power that yes, yes. the church has shied away from. If you want to have access to all the amazing things that God is trying to do in the world today, you can read your Bible and go to church and pray and do all those ordinary things all day long, and it won't work because what you really need to do is start honoring these dead people, and then stuff will start to happen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And we have a responsibility. It's a responsibility of honor, but Mm -hmm. it's also a responsibility to preserve the testimony because that's the spoken and or written record of what God has done. We don't need to keep alive and honor the memory of people like John G. Lake, John Alexander Dowie, Charles Fox Parham, and a host of other early Pentecostal leaders who were not good men. They were not good biblical teachers at all. Yeah. which prophesies his intent into this generation. And if we don't steward the testimony well, the record of his nature, mm-hmm. the displays of his covenant with people, if we don't steward that well, we're not really prepared for what he wants to do again. Yeah. So according to Bill Johnson, God wants to do a bunch of stuff in the world today, and he can't. What we need to do is start talking about John G. Lakemore and collecting relics so we can keep perpetuating the autobiographical exaggerations of con artists, frauds, and blowhards from 100 years ago. If you like the false teachings of Kenneth Copeland, well, then you would love the false teachings of John G. Lake. The exact spiritual DNA of Jesus. You're not a little like him. You are exactly like him. Why is it when you look at Jesus, it's like you're looking in a mirror? Because you were born in his image. You were created in his image and likeness. Do you understand that? So Jesus, God was the painter. You're the painting. And Jesus was the model. Let's listen to some quotes from the very godlike John G. Lake. The power of God, the Holy Ghost, is the spirit of dominion. It makes one a god. The Christian lives as God in the world dominating sin, evil, sickness. Cast it out as evil. It is not of God. Dominate it. Put it away. It is not honoring to Jesus Christ that sickness should possess us. We do not want disease. We want to be gods. Jesus said, I said ye are gods. It is with the attitude of gods in the world that Jesus wants the Christian to live. Now here's what Bill Johnson said in his book, The Essential Guide to Healing. Reading John G. Lake furthered my quest along the way. His insights into the spirit-filled life are the greatest I have seen anywhere. His insights and stories ruined me. I think I agree with him there. Here's another quote from Kenneth Copeland. Oops, I mean John G. Lake. I want you to hear what Jesus said about himself. God was in Christ, wasn't he? An incarnation. God is in you, an incarnation. If you were born again, you are incarnate. You were born again of the Spirit. You were born of the Spirit. You were born exactly with the same spiritual DNA as Jesus. You were born with the DNA of God Almighty. You're not a little like Jesus. You are exactly like Jesus. (laughs) It's actually, this is what's possible in the Lord. Yes. And that's kind of what we're after. Exactly. Uh, You know, uh, as far as a touchstone, I was at Nyack and I, um, college in New York, and I happened to see A.B. Simpson's grave is there, so as we're touring the campus, it was there. And it was, it was meaningful to just be, uh, again, not to you know have some weird, like I'm, there's a special anointing here, but again, to go, this man was mightily uh, used by the Lord. Absolutely. And uh, was, uh, you know, he was empowering women in ministry way before that time. He, was, he had uh, racial unity was going on in his ministry. He was ministering to the poor of New York, doing a yeah, radically yeah, beautiful yeah. work. And being in his grave, and, and also <coughs> it was connected to also some of the martyrs uh, that, that that denomination, the CMA, has experienced as well, and feeling like, oh, there's a weight and a gravitas to wow. 
wow. to these experiences again. And, and we it's a disservice when we act like these aren't important. So Dan has basically changed the entire topic here to not one about grave soaking, but about should we honor great men of God who did great things in the past? Well, everybody agrees that we should honor great men who did great things in the past. That's not what this is about. But by changing the subject, he kind of moves us away from the very real topic of how Bethel has been promoting this idea that you can get anointings from dead people's graves. Aren't real. But again, so for clear, we're not going to graves sucking the anointing. <laughs> Some students were leaning over the back of the grave and they felt a grace and a faith just rest on them. It's funny, isn't it? How, you know, Elisha, um, I think someone put the, the, bo the person's bones on his bones and they got raised up to life. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, he still exists there. For clear, we're not going to graves sucking the anointing <laughs> out of them. But Watch what happens if we change the term grave sucking or grave soaking and change it to releasing of the anointing from the dead person's grave. We just release the anointing of God um, that is in this place and we pray that faith, faith, great faith would come on you. The anointing for awakening That's right it. here can come upon your life now in Jesus' name. Jesus. So we release it on you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wow. <laughs> but we no. are not afraid no. of like uh, of honoring and revering what God's done through the saints in the past. No. That's right. That's right. Let's just set aside the issue of the very fact that some of these men that they honor were not great men of God at all. Let's just set that aside and let's just go with the idea that there are certain great men of God that most Christians agree did good things and we should honor them. No one's actually questioning that. No one's even discussing that. So why should we even care that they have this uh, courage to honor and revere what God has done through saints in the past? That's not the topic. Now let's read that quote again from Bill Johnson in the book, The Physics of Heaven. There are anointings, mantles, revelations, and mysteries that have lain unclaimed literally where they were left because the generation that walked in them never passed them on. I believe it's possible for us to recover realms of anointing, realms of insight, realms of God that have been untended for decades simply by choosing to reclaim them and perpetuate them for future generations. Does that sound like he's saying, let's just honor the legacy of what God did through certain people a long time ago? No, he's saying we got to go claim stuff. There's these things that are sitting there waiting for us to go get them. You know, like going to people's graves and getting the anointings. I don't know. How do you get them? I don't know. You maybe soak them up or you suck them up. Yeah, that's what he was referring to without using those actual words. Let's listen to Bill Johnson again in this very same interview just a few minutes earlier. But if we honored them, the Lord would give us access to the grace that they lived in. But this is not a biblical doctrine. This is just something that Bill Johnson believes and is teaching, but it's not anywhere found in the Bible, you know, the Word of God. So being a non-charismatic and it kind of coming, and then there's all this risk happening, and I, I affectionately, uh, at least I think I coined the phrase spooky church because so many things happened that were just spooky to me. And I, I'd like go home and go, oh Lord, what are we doing? I want to talk about all those right now because we can talk about those in other podcasts. But I Do you remember that Bible verse where Christians are instructed to have a spooky church that makes you very uncomfortable so that you can take risks? Yeah, neither do I. I was on a 10 or 12 year, you know, still am. Like when I see something unusual happen in the Lord, I'm like, I try to like, instead of just judging it, immediately go, Holy Spirit, is that you? How much of it is you? Yeah. What do I make of it? Yeah. And knowing the response of my heart to that in the moment, it actually says a lot about how I'm growing in the Lord. Here are examples of Bethel's spooky church that you're supposed to accept. This is when Randy Clark was there visiting for his special healing services. Just remember, you must not be judgmental. This might be God. So according to Dan, when things happen in church that make you very uncomfortable and they're spooky and you have no idea if they're from God or not, you're not supposed to judge them. You're supposed to be non-judgmental as you ask the Holy Spirit to internally give you a message about specific things taking place as to whether they're from God or not. This again is not a biblical doctrine. This actually goes against biblical doctrine. And it replaces the Word of God with your subjective personal experiences. You know, in that moment. So this idea though, um, 
uh, whenever I was going to write about grave sucking, just like, we don't do this, leave us alone, stop saying this. I, there is a, a story from a school of ministry, though, that I do think it's instructive. So I'll, I'll unpack that. And, and I never know, like, if I'm, am I sharing too much and I'm going to freak people out here more. But in our culture where we're actually experiencing the presence of the Lord and inviting people to, to experience the Lord's presence, unusual things happen. Things that actually are called God that aren't, but it takes a while to figure that out. Unusual things happen. Things that actually are called God that aren't, but it takes a while to figure that out. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I would say that, you know, the Lord hits somebody and maybe, again, I'm making up this percentage, but it's 10% God and 90% the person, but that's 10% more of God than they ever had before. So, you know, you're on this journey, yeah. you know, of like, I've just got to, I've, I've got to, with the community, with our feedback with each other, uh, you know, kind of walk these journeys of risk. So in the school of ministry, we had, one of our leaders had a profound encounter with the Lord. Uh, at the grave of a former church leader. So wow, 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 wow. he comes back and gives a testimony about this. And because our students are so hungry, <laughs> I mean, it's like meat to a wolf at some level. Like, you're kidding? The Lord will meet you at a grave? So it, it, I remember in that as the yeah. dean watching it, like— So now Dan is remembering as the dean of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, he remembers all of this happening. Remember when he said this just a few minutes earlier? Never taught it, <laughs> never done it. Whoa, what, what? But but I've had to learn over time, like, if I try to kill something too early, that's, that's we, we totally yeah. miss the, potentially the good things. And again, the weird things that come. But when I kill everything too early, our people, our students stop, stop taking risks. So this is the part of the interview where Dan is admitting, yeah, there was this thing happening where people were going to graves and doing these weird things, but I didn't stop it because they uh, need to experiment. And we have this culture of risk, and you don't want to ever stop things, even if they might be wrong and weird and unbiblical. Some good thing might come as a result, so we just let these things continue. So that's the number one thing. So the students hear this testimony, and this is, well, I talk, I talk about this. This is a good problem. Every pastor in America would want this problem. So in the beginning of this discussion, Dan is saying, we never did these things. We don't know what this is all about. These are just rumors. These are people saying mean things on the internet. Now he's saying, well, yeah, these things happened, and actually you should want these things to happen. That's a sign that you have a very healthy environment because that means people are willing to step out and take risks. That we give a testimony of God's encounter and our people reflexively go, I want that. I'm in. I want more of that. <laughs> like, you can, the Lord's over there, I'm coming. And so this is a beautiful, like, like the great sucking is an unfortunate result of a beautiful hunger. Yeah, for the true. presence of God. And again, yeah. when the critic labels it, I'm like, hey, this is actually a problem you'd want. You'd want your people so zealous for the Lord's presence that you have to be cautious about what you say because they will move to it. So I think we got guys like Ben Fitzgerald, who's you know a worldwide ev evangelist, yeah. one of our guys who love him to pieces. He's got a, a video online about like, he's just hungry. He's yeah. hungry and he's like, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll cross oceans, I'll do whatever to experience the presence of the Lord. And so that thing is the heart that we're building. Yeah. Dan Farrelly is a great spin doctor. This is a great PR campaign, because if you actually watch the video, like we did, of Ben Fitzgerald, he's not saying, I'm just hungry, I'll do whatever. No, he's trying to get the anointing out of the graves of dead people. That's what we can actually see him doing. That's what we can hear him saying. He's going to get the anointing from the grave of the dead person. Some students were leaning over the back of the grave, and they felt a grace and a faith just rest on them. It's funny, isn't it? How, you know, Elijah, um, I think someone put the, the, bo the person's bones on his bones, and they got raised up to life. When you come into a place where the Holy Spirit was on a person, he still exists there. Yeah. Now, so this, this idea of grave sucking as a practice was so, it, it's just like a, almost uh, a weird demonic assault against this beautiful, hungry heart. Yeah that it became, I was even just resentful, but I'm not even gonna talk about that. So the people who were trying to get some sort of an anointing off of the grave of a dead person, well, that was the result of a beautiful heart, in the words of Dan Farrelly, and the bad part was not the practice itself, but the demonic attack that came from critics who were skeptical of this practice and said that it was a bad idea and was an unbiblical teaching. Yeah, I'm not I, talk about. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's, just, it, it's nothing could misrepresent yes. what we live and practice in community, accountable. Yep. you know nothing could could yep. e even if it would have been mentioned by one of our team members, it would have been in jest. It would have been, you know, in well, no, the, almost... Actually, uh, I know where you're going with this, but he had this one team member had real experiences, uh, had a real incredible experience that kind of helped light a fire. Yeah, yeah. But again, once it got, once it kind of got traction, I, yeah, the, the term grave sucking, because I'm a bit snarky, I was actually thought it was 
delightful. Early on, I went, oh gosh, if you're going to purposely misunderstand that much, and then I'm like, well done, sir. But the, <laughs> but over time, you're like, okay, it, in the age of the internet, and yeah, yeah. and as our footprint got bigger, you know, when we're smaller, it's not as painful, you know, like, but exactly. but as our footprint gets bigger, and then people are like, hey, and then they perpetuate lies, um, you're like, oh, that 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 does hurt. That's, yeah, yeah, that's tough. I totally agree that it hurts when people lie about you, and we should never do that to each other as Christians, but I don't understand what the lies are, because the more they talk, the more they make it clear that they knew about these practices taking place within their church. It does. So there's a picture of your wife, Benny, being uh, laying down on a grave. And yeah, that is actually yeah, yeah. like, so when we say we don't practice this, you're like, ah, we have photographic evidence <laughs> of Benny laying on the grave. What, what, what is she doing? What's her story in that? What's, what's up to? What's... To his credit, Dan did ask Bill a pretty direct question. And I want you to pay attention now to Bill's answer, which is more like a non-answer. You know, our whole deal is we, we want to respond to God in a way that he wants us to respond. Mm -hmm. If I kneel, if I dance, I've shouted, I've danced before the Lord, I'll lay prostrate before the Lord, and it's that's all it is. Is it's we want to be uh, responsive enough to His impressions that we'll do whatever He says to do. So it sounds like Bill is saying that his wife was laying on a grave because God specifically told her to do so, and risk looking like a fool in the process, risk being misunderstood in the process. So instead of Directly answering the direct question, he's trying to get sympathy for himself and for his wife. They were doing this risky thing. They were not afraid of looking like fools. No, she was actually very proud of what she was doing. She put it on Instagram and she said, this is what I do. She wasn't saying, oh, I hope people don't mind that I'm doing this embarrassing thing. She was proud of it. But now Bill is positioning himself and his wife as victims. It doesn't, uh, you know, there's no, you don't, you don't get bonus points for being ridiculed, but it, it's, it's just. Oh, no, if you're afraid of ridicule, you'll never do anything great for God. I yeah. mean, just any, any, any great leader in any field has yeah. had yeah, opponents, critics, and ridicule and mocking. Yeah. I, the, you know what else great leaders do? They directly answer questions. They don't dodge questions. They don't go around the block and try to avoid the question that's being asked of them. They just come right out and say the truth, and they let the chips fall where they may. And they certainly don't make themselves out to be victims, as we're seeing in this discussion. Uh, you know, the, 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 when the Holy Spirit hit and in joy that it was praises in known languages, people went, they're drunk. Yeah. I mean, in, in the instant, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there are people who go, oh, that, yeah, that, they're drunk. Yeah. So you, you won't do anything in God if you are perpetually trying to please everybody. So at the beginning of this video, they were talking about all of the myths surrounding Bethel and the so-called grave-soaking thing that wasn't really happening at all. Now it's turned into, well, if you're going to do great things for God, you've got to be willing to accept the ridicule that will come your way when you do these great and mighty things for the Lord. Which is another part. Like, I'm always saying to the, <laughs> our team, like, the Internet's always mad about something. I mean, like, I'm not going to... I'm not going to let them uh, control our agenda by what they're exactly, mad about because exactly. there's a part of the internet that's just a machine of rage and frustration. And like, yeah. it'll never be satisfied. Yeah. So that, I don't think either one of us wants to speak to that, that thing because no, no. it's unsatiable. <clears throat> but there yeah. are fellow saints who are like, I just need to know yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you guys We're, are safe and yeah. not, not super weird. Spooky, but not super weird. Yeah. <laughs> We're willing to do whatever we feel like you said to do. I mean, you know, honestly. Uh, so in that moment, Benny's responding to the, the leadership, yeah. the, 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 the promptings of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Yeah, yeah. it looks strange. Yeah. You know, I, I get it. Yeah. I've, I've been in those places, too, where my response was not something I'd want filmed, but it's, yeah. you know, it's it's uh, some of the great evangelists have described their prayer time behind closed doors and said, well, you know, we wouldn't want that filmed. It's their cry to God. You know, it, it would look strange to the to the outsider looking in, uh, the tears, the weeping, the mm -hmm. whatever it may be before the Lord. Hey, uh, Bill Johnson, if you were to take video footage of yourself crying and weeping before the Lord because you were so repentant, uh, I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. That's not what this discussion is about, but boy, you are really good at changing the subject. What about your wife smiling and posting about her laying on graves and saying, this is what I do? What about that? Um, you know, there are just, they're just times where we respond intimately to him, and, uh, and it's, not always, it's not always squeaky clean. It's just honest. Wow, it may not be squeaky clean, but man, it's honest. That, that doesn't actually mean anything, Bill Johnson. I'm not tricked by it. I'm really sad that you have millions of people around the world who are tricked by it. But I hope that because of this video, less people than before will be tricked by the games that you play with words. Hi, 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 hi. And so we, we create room in how we do life that, 
You know, I might not get it right. I I may next week go, ah, I shouldn't have done that. No, but that's right. that is how we do life. No, it's. I remember around this time, people were like, well, there's the passage in Ezekiel where uh, the dead guy was thrown in and they touched. It's not in Ezekiel. Sorry, it's about the prophet. Yeah, it's, uh, in, it's in the prophet. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, where the bones touched the dead bones of the prophet. It's funny, isn't it? How you know Elisha? Um, I think someone put the the, bo- the person's bones on his bones and they got raised up to life. And then, and so even someone in our team was like wondering, like, hey, is there something to like, hey, ooh, no, 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 like what? Uh, we're not going there. Are we saying an anointing is seeking through, uh, you know, a concrete vault and up through, like, like, and that the dirt, like, no. But I do remember as we were wondering aloud, and we, Beth, exactly. we'll do this. We will wonder aloud, and then we will kind of yeah. go like, whoa, what you're not saying is this. Like, oh no, I'm not saying that. So, yeah, yeah. so we, we, um, I know as even in that season, there was some articulation that we had to kind of go, hey, that that's not what's happening. Whatever you think is happening with a God encounter, yeah. it ain't that. Yeah. And then we talk through, you know, the implications of that. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and so there's a kind of a self-correcting that we'll do, but we will noodle, uh, you know, and, and wonder and experience a while as we're pressing forward. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So after all of that, do you understand what they actually teach and what they actually believe and what they're actually against? I'm not really sure. In fact, half the time, I'm not even sure what they're talking about. But hey, what do you expect? This is a culture that places a high value on noodling. By the way, have you forgotten that Bill Johnson never answered the question directly as to what his wife was doing with those graves? He sure hopes so. (laughs) So that's that's kind of how we think about it. And people have to realize what is they they write us. What does Bethel think about? I'm like, well, there's Bill and the whole apostolic team. So even on our team, we think some different things sometimes. Like we talk to each other, we probably have some different (laughs) ideas about the end times, about various things, about the the mechanism, how things work. But that's part of our beauty is we don't have giant groupthink in some ways. We will we will listen to the other yeah. people who are encountering the Lord in this. And there's other folks that have a different maybe perspective on this. We know that um, uh, you know the, the Catholics have a, uh, have relics and have something in their theology for relics and, and the, the bones of the saints. That wouldn't be something that would, you know, we are participating in or interested in. But again, we're not trying to kill them over that. That would be like, ah, we pr- prefer you don't. We, don't. we don't know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot in that for us. <laughs> Yeah. But we don't need to separate from you. No, that's right. You know, because of this. And so there there are um there are other groups that might have a different perspective. But this would be where we land on this and hopefully it sets the record straight. But this would be where we land on this and hopefully it sets the record straight. And it becomes the dominant hopefully the truth of what we actually do becomes uh yeah. the dominant uh, articulation that's out there. <laughs> One can wish. One can wish. (laughs) Okay, thank you so much for watching up to this point. I spent a lot more time making this video and responding to a lot of the things that were said in in the original Bethel video than I expected. And I want to remind you again that the American Gospel Spirit and Fire docuseries will be coming out soon that will be going into more detail with a wide variety of guests more than just listening to me. Now, let's talk about this book, The Physics of Heaven. This is the book that Bill and Benny Johnson contributed chapters to and that you just heard Dan Farrelly read from earlier in the Rediscover Bethel video. The Bethel bookstore on their website has a lot of books, and it used to have The Physics of Heaven. After all, one of the co-authors, Judy Franklin, she's the personal assistant to Bill Johnson. But just in the last year, they removed this book from the website, and kind of like the issue of grave soaking, they want you to forget about this book. They don't want you to know that there ever was a book called The Physics of Heaven. But this book is a Bethel book. It's got Bill and Benny Johnson. It's got Chris Valentin. It's got Judy Franklin, who is Bill Johnson's personal assistant. It's even got Bob Jones. The Lord had told me to wear a coat, a heavy one. It would be a sign uh, that, that there'd be a double winner that year. If you took all of the really bad Christian books that have ever been written and you put them all together in a blender, it would probably read something like The Physics of Heaven. This is a book full of nutjobs and quacks. This isn't even lucid thinking or speaking. Everything in here is false. Everything. I'm not just saying this from a traditional biblical viewpoint. I'm saying science, history, music, sound, quantum physics. Everything that this book has to say about those topics, and especially about Christianity, is just plain false. Here, I want you to listen to just a little bit of what Mike Winger had to say. Um... I do believe and I'm convinced, and I'm going to give you the evidence as to why, that the the movement is building a bridge for Christians to head towards the New Age, New Age beliefs and practices, calling it Christian, um, but also self-deception more broadly, encouraging Christians to move towards self-deception in the name of Christ, in the name of prophecy. And I'm, I'm sorry to make this video. This is new information. I did a video on Bethel a long time ago <clears throat> where I talked about 
Bill Johnson and I evaluated his teachings. Um, and this is more information I didn't have back then. And I feel compelled to add to it. I would have been more harsh um, uh, on on Bill Johnson and on the Chris, uh, his his um, his prophet, and and the the different teachings that are going on in this in this area. Uh, not hopefully overly harsh, but I would have been more harsh had I known what I know now. And I actually read this book a while back, but I I just haven't found the time to make a review. So here's a review, and I've discovered a lot of content that I think is very important to share. So. This book seeks to build a bridge between Christians and the New Age woo, and it is called The Physics of Heaven. Um, it is endorsed by leaders, and we'll, we'll go through some of the endorsement and messages and stuff. We're going to go through the book thoroughly today, as well as a, another book written by the same author. Um, it's endorsed by um, uh, Bethel leadership, like Chris Vallotton, or the um, <clears throat> the leader of Jesus Culture, uh, whose name escapes me. I have it in my notes. I'll read it to you in a moment. Um Bill Johnson contributes chapters to this book. Benny Johnson, his wife, who sadly, tragically recently passed away from cancer, she contributes chapters to this book, and they've definitely endorsed it. Judy Franklin worked at Bethel at the time she wrote this, and she is one of the go-to people for helping, according to Bethel and their style, their method, helping train others how to take trips to heaven and how to experience visions, ultimately of their own making, uh, as well as, in this book, to move towards the new age. A couple of the things that you will hear from defenders of Bethel is that, one, people who don't agree with them simply don't agree with charismatic beliefs or traditional Pentecostal beliefs. But the truth is, Mike Winger himself is a charismatic. He's a great guy. I would disagree with him on some things, and he would disagree with me on some things, but we're both brothers in Christ. We both teach biblical Christianity. I want you to understand that this man, who is a charismatic, is going way out of his way to make the point that Bethel is teaching horrible, dangerous theology. That's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is, Bethel will tell you that the people who are opposed to Bethel teaching, people who don't like Bill Johnson or Chris Valentin's teaching, well, those are people who have never really experienced it for themselves. That's the problem. They don't have the Holy Spirit. There's something wrong with their heart. They've got uh, some kind of a, a hurt, a wound, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Jesse Westwood actually went to this school, and he had a good experience, and he liked it until he realized that the actual teaching itself was incredibly unbiblical. I did an interview with him last year, and uh, since then, his own channel has taken off, and he did a video, which is what you can see here, where he watched Mike Winger, and he said, yep, that's what I was taught. Yep, that's exactly what happened at Bethel, and his video has over 100,000 views. Jesse will also be in the upcoming American Gospel Spirit and Fire docuseries, as well as some other former Bethel people who will be describing what they went through, what they learned, how they came out of it. And I think it'll be very helpful for people who are really confused by this whole movement and are confused by the teachings of Bethel and other places like that. So please stay tuned for that. I'm going to end this video now, finally, but I do want to just let you know that I've been studying this movement, the New Apostolic Reformation, for over 10 years since I saw it creeping into the church that I used to be a member of. So I am very familiar with this movement. I'm just not a guy from the outside observing it. I was actually in it. So there's a lot of resources on the Messed Up Church website, as well as a lot of other channels that I recommend, a lot of playlists on this channel. There's a million ways that you can get more information so that you can become a more biblically sound Christian and have that peace that maybe is missing in your life at this point in time. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. God bless. Bust out!